This is a production of Cornell University. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about one of our larger research projects, which is GLAZE, Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering. Um, and a little bit of background, I, I direct Cornell's Controlled Environment Agriculture Group, and CEA is a way to grow crops under protection. You might think of it as a continuum from high tunnels, which I would call modified environment agriculture, all the way up to like greenhouses with supplemental lighting and carbon dioxide enrichment, to also vertical farms, which are kind of a curious phenomenon that we won't go that much into. Um, but uh, so CA then allows us to grow um, crops uh, up to year round and to optimize their timing um, so we can produce a lot more per acre. Um, in the case of lettuce, we can produce about 20 to 25 uh, times uh, what a field acre can produce if we have an acre of sophisticated greenhouse. Um, and so they give us high plant quality, predictable crop timing and consistently available, which supermarkets and consumers tend to like. Um, one of the biggest issues, so, so labor is always the largest uh, production input, um, and then energy is the second largest production input. And actually when we've done some of our um, analyses of looking at producing like lettuce in a greenhouse in New York, it has slightly higher carbon emissions profile than growing lettuce in a field in California and shipping it 3,000 miles. So obviously we want to decrease that, that carbon footprint. There are other environmental metrics that are better in a greenhouse like water and nutrient use efficiency and, and pesticide use and so on, but we need to get carbon emissions down. Um, and the production value of CEA has grown a lot over the years. I, I love looking at the USDA Census of Agriculture, which comes out every five years. And it recently uh, came out with the 2022 data. Um, and in New York, our CEA sector grew by 72% in the last five years. Um, we're third in the nation, um, kind of dwarfed by California, but here we are. Um, and um, the US-wide, it has grown by 30% uh, in the last five years. Um, so one of the kind of disrupting technologies in a good way has been LED lighting. Um, and LED lights are now available on the market that use half of the energy per unit of light they deliver than um, status quo lights, which used to be like high pressure sodium lights, kind of like modified uh, street lights. Um, and then LEDs also give us the opportunity to adjust the spectrum of light that's delivered. Um, so you can buy like LEDs that might have kind of eight different uh, spectra or channels that you can adjust. Um, and I always like to say kind of the engineering of these lighting fixtures has far surpassed our ability as, as horticulturalists or plant scientists to understand their effects on the plant. So we can deliver to a grower this great LED fixture, but we can't tell them what is the right like light recipe or how you should adjust those, those spectrum of light. Um, so myself and other scientists across the world um, address that as well. Um, and unfortunately though, so, so LEDs could save us half of the energy and lighting and, um, and lighting is about half of the total energy used in a greenhouse in New York State, heating being the other um, component. Um, and currently, well, this was as of 2020, so it's ticked up a little bit, but about 2% of the lit area in um, vegetable greenhouses are LEDs, um, about 11% of the lit area in cannabis operations. So they're kind of the early adopters in this case. Um, and some of the barriers to adoption are, initially there was a high um, upfront cost for LEDs. So when I first study, started researching this area in like 2015, it was about a 10 to 12 year payback to adopt a more energy efficient LED. Now the payback has gone down to about three to five years, which is kind of marginal for a grower to adopt. I think ideally they'd want something that has a two to three year um, payback. Um, and then there's also these questions of how can I, like what spectrum of light should I use? What, how do I program the light fixture to complement the sun, for example? Um, and so those kind of become the, the barriers to adoption. Um, so starting in 2017, we were fortunate to get um, seed funding from NYSERDA. We got um, $3 million to our program at Cornell, um, and we have colleagues at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute that do a lot of lighting engineering, and then colleagues at Rutgers University um, that work on, on greenhouse engineering as well. Um, and our goal is to drive adoption of LEDs um, initially in New York, but also like within North America. Um, so that the CEA industry becomes more energy efficient. And the kind of optimistic goal, at least when we started talking about this in like 2016, 2017, our goal was to reduce electricity use by lighting um, by 70% versus the 2014 baseline with those, those high pressure sodium lights. 
Um, and that became a combination. These things aren't additive, they're mul multiplicative, um, but these end up giving us a 70% decrease in energy so that um, so LEDs are on the market now that are 50% more energy efficient. Um, we believe that there's gains that we, we can make from lighting and carbon dioxide control, um, and then adjusting the spectrum of light for certain outcomes um, collectively could give us that 70%. Um, and so we have this seven-pronged approach for research. We won't go into all of these, but I'll share a few vignettes of our um, research. Um, so um, lots of things from like, how do plants respond to spectrum of light? How do we adjust the light to take into account sun? How do we selectively enrich a greenhouse with carbon dioxide, but not when a greenhouse is hot and ventilating because we don't want to lose that carbon dioxide? Um, and then how do we implement um, kind of pilot scale tests uh, with commercial greenhouses in New York State um, to see if they, they see the same benefits that we do in our research on campus? Um, so the Glaze Consortium has, um, we have about 20 members annually that actually pay and they support some of our applied research. Most, most of our research uh, funding comes from NYSERDA, but also the like outreach component or industry adoption component. Um, so we have quarterly industry meetings, we have monthly newsletters and webinars, we have an annual short course, which is like 12 hours of remote um, distance learning, and then we have an in-person uh, summit. Um, and then just a couple of vignettes of our own research. So we a uh, big thrust has been how do we adjust lights to um, complement the sun to get a target daily light integral um, or a total amount of light in a day. Um, and it turns out that that currently most greenhouse control systems use a less than optimum method. Um, so they they use what's called a threshold method. So every 10 minutes they turn lights on or off. So if the sun uh, gets covered by a cloud, they'll turn lights on. Um, and then if the sun comes back, they'll turn they'll turn the lights off. Um, however, that fails to kind of predict what the total amount of light you get during the day is. So we have an algorithm that was previously developed um, by Professor Lou Albright in biological and environmental engineering um, that, that made more um, uh, accurate predictions based on the day of the year and the latitude and some greenhouse specifications. And then now that we have LEDs, what we can do is we can actually dim them. So we have a target instantaneous light level, and then we'll dim them on a 10 minute interval to complement the sun. Um, so basically we're taking the same amount of light um, and spreading it over more hours in the day um, and reducing kind of over lighting. Um, and we found for strawberries and tomatoes, we can see about a 30% yield benefit when we apply those strategies. Um, and we're still in the process of testing them in commercial facilities. Um, just in terms of um, spectrum effects, um, so blue light usually gives more compact plants. It reduces cell elongation. Um, and but a positive thing is that it can increase nutrition. So this is red leaf lettuce, which is high in anthocyanins. So if we have low blue light, uh, we have a bigger plant, um, but poor anthocyanins or poor nutritional content. So we found that just two days of blue light exposure at the end of the crop cycle kind of gives us um, the best of both worlds where we can get a larger size plant, but also higher in nutrition. So I think I better stop there. <laughs> Any questions for me? Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, you mentioned this curious phenomenon of the towers going up, but then um, some of the stuff that you're saying prompts me, as usual, to think about going down. Yeah, yeah. That it's too hot in the summer, you're, you know, losing your CO2, mm -hmm. it's too cold mm -hmm. in the winter, your heating bill goes up. If you were semi underground, could you could you kind of optimize those bills since you're LED anyway? It, it would help. Yeah. So the the question relates to kind of like vertical farms. Um, so producing in the absence of sunlight or or maybe even to greenhouses um, and the heating costs that they have. So could we go underground to get more stable um, temperature? Um, and so I'll, I'll point out that um, vertical farm, like a traditional vertical farm uses about two and a half times the energy as a greenhouse because you have to provide all of the sunlight. And there's also a lot of like air conditioning and dehumidification that has to happen. Um, so then people have looked into ways of, at least on a small scale, these kind of like solar greenhouses built into the ground. They're widely adopted in like China, for example. Um, the New York climate might not be such a great fit because we don't have a lot of sun in the winter time. Um, and we need sun to like heat those up and then preserve the heat um, with the earth. But I, what I do think will be practical is geothermal. Um, and so that could e either be like deep geothermal, like drilling down thousands of feet for a large greenhouse. Um, or geothermal connected um, to heat pumps for a smaller size greenhouses. 
Um, and I'm working on a research proposal now, which is a pathway toward decarbonizing the greenhouse industry in the US. I think is a, we need to get there, whether it be 20 or 30 years, but it's kind of a, a wild, crazy idea right now. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.